Jesus meant his words, every one of them, they are eternal in scope, and it's entirely possible that you've been underestimating just exactly what the Bible is. My Muslim friends think of it as the background text to their demonic Quran. My secular scholarly friends think of it merely as the best preserved historical document in history. And my theologically liberal friends think of it as a collection of allegories by which to live out a more moral life. All of these, all of these miss it. Every soul in hell knows altogether entirely too late this is the word of God, that Jesus meant what he said. Now, are you living in light of that truth? Are you living in light of the fact that Jesus meant every word that he said? Or have you just merely looked at the surface? Have you merely looked at them for face value and thinking in, the, in earthly terms about heavenly truths, earthly, earthly reflections of a heavenly reality? The mere surface, earth level of Jesus' miracles and Jesus' teachings, and you never grow deeper, and you never apply them. Does this describe your understanding of the Bible, your relationship with Jesus, your Christianity? Surface level, earthly in nature, never going deeper, nothing eternal at, at, at stake at all. Today is the day that you step into the deep as it calls you. This is Mark chapter 8. We're gonna pick up in verse 11. I know that our curriculum is in Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 45, and the next week we're gonna catch back up, but there's something back here in chapter eight that I wanted to go back and get because it's too important. It's too important. All around Jesus are people who are underestimating his miracles and his teachings. People who miss the larger point. His Pharisees, the Pharisees largely missed the point of the parables. His own disciples, however, seem to miss the point of his miracles. And Jesus is even berating them for this. This is something that even pervades today. I have seen theories trying to explain, for example, the plague of frogs on Egypt as a naturally occurring phenomenon. Somebody who doesn't really believe in God, believes that the plague of frogs actually happened and has a purely materialistic explanation for how it happened. Explaining something about the breeding habits of frogs in Egypt. And I ask the question, yeah, but do you know why? Do you understand, do you understand that miracle? I mean, like you're speculating as to the mechanics of it, but do you understand the purpose of it? Do you know why frogs at all? Right? And it was, it was largely lost on my friend. I've seen another theory about Jesus walking on water, trying to explain it away using this particularly shallow portion of the Sea of Galilee. Do you understand what's really happening in that text? Like, why would you feel the need to dismiss it? Why would you feel the need to find a naturalistic explanation for this miracle? Or, this is funny too, debate as to what type of fish swallowed Jonah. Like, it matters. For the record, my son Ace thinks it was a megalodon. He refers to the story as Jonah and the Megalodon. <laughs> None of these actually matters. Like these, these mechanics of the miracles, like they're, they're irrelevant. They're irrelevant. Understand the purpose of the miracles. The eternal reality is being conveyed through the miracles. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what type of frog it was around Egypt. The point is... Yahweh is God, and Hecate, the frog god of Egypt, is not. That's the point. Okay, that's the point of the actual miracle. All right, it doesn't matter what kind of fish swallowed Jonah. What matters is God told him to go to Nineveh, and God gets his way. Okay, that's, that's the point. That's what actually matters there. Right, it doesn't matter what part of the Sea of Galilee Jesus was walking on. What matters is he is Lord over the elements. It's his water. He can walk on it if he wants. It's, it's like... Studying a fire alarm as it sounds off. Here it is, this plastic red shell around a blinking bulb with a speaker just blaring out the most noxious sonic concoction ever devised by wicked man. And it's blindingly bright. 
and a committee has gathered around it. Okay, we are going to study the composition and viscosity of the plasticizers that make up the red shell. You guys, I wanna know what kind of monofilament is used in that blinking bulb, okay? You guys, I want you to figure out the original sound sample that became the siren, okay? And then you guys, you study the hieroglyphs written down the side, F-I-R-E. I I wanna know their background, all right? Let's study this in depth. And then all burn with a stupid shocked look on their faces. You can understand everything there is to know about a fire alarm and miss the point completely. Don't get caught up parsing out the finer mechanics of the miracles and miss their purpose entirely. Look to Jesus' miracles and understand why the miracle. When we studied the feeding of the 5,000, shortly thereafter, Jesus was walking on water and his disciples were full of fear at the sight of him because, the text said, they didn't understand the loaves. They didn't understand what had just happened in that miracle. They didn't understand what Jesus was showing them through the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 that took place in Jewish territory. Now that figure 5,000 refers only to the men. The crowd in its total size could have been roughly 20,000. Now we've come upon another miraculous feeding. There was a feeding of the 5,000. People often overlook the fact that there was then a subsequent feeding of the 4,000. And again, this 4,000 could have referred to a crowd as large as 16,000 because that 4,000 referred only to the men in the crowd. So once again, let it not be said of us that we miss the point of the miracle. You're gonna see Jesus hammer his disciples for missing the point of the miracles. He's going to... Feed 4,000 people now in Gentile territory. The first one took place largely in Jewish territory. Now he's feeding 4,000 men, a crowd of potentially 6,000, and he's doing this in Gentile territory. So look at the context. Look, here's a picture of my Bible. I'm, I'm using the same, the same Bible that are, in, that are in the seats. Okay, same Bibles that are in the seats. That's what I, this, is, this is how I outline my sermons, all right? I, I block out what text is being studied by the curriculum and then I preach around it. These subtitles were not divinely inspired. They were put there by our friends at Crossway Bible Publishers just as headings for us to navigate the text, but they tell a story on this page. All right, this is, uh, <laughs> this is it's the same pagination as the Bibles in the seats with you. This is page 843. Do you see this, this heading that says, the Pharisees demand a sign? And then just like, look what comes, look what appears above it. Look at the heading above it. Jesus feeds the 4,000. That's funny to me. <laughs> Jesus feeds 4,000 people. And then verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. He feeds thousands of people. And then they say, give us a sign. <laughs> 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 The Pharisees were insatiable in their desire for signs, wonders, miracle, and proof, and tests. They would watch him break physics and then ask him for proof. I mean, they, all the proof that they saw would just add up before them on judgment day. Can I, can I speak to my skeptical friends? I've heard this line, okay? I've led multiple atheists to Christ, and many of them gave me this same line that I bet you've got in your back pocket right now, okay? Keep it in your pocket because it's, it's dangerous. This, I'll believe in God when I see some proof of God, like when God does what I ask him to do, when God works a miracle at my request, then I will believe in him. Put that in your pocket and leave it there. You don't actually want that miracle to take place. You don't actually want a miracle. In fact, let's be brutally honest, you're counting on God not doing that miracle. All right, the absence of that miracle is what you think gives you license to keep sinning right now. So you're hoping to God he doesn't do that miraculous thing. Because the moment that he does, you're gonna feel like you gotta, you gotta repent from sin. But let's also be honest, even if he did, even if he did do the miracle you're hoping he doesn't do, you're just gonna want another one after that. And then he's gonna do that. And then you're gonna want another one. 
and then another one. And then you're gonna have an explanation that just dismisses all of the collective miracles. This is nothing new. This is thousands of years old. This is the way that it's historically always gone. People groups who saw miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle just demanded more miracles and their faith would wander away. There's no people group in history more, uh, more condemned by the miracles they saw than people we see listed in the Bible. For example, the first generation of Israelites who escaped slavery in Egypt saw the most cataclysmic, earth-shattering miracles ever, and they wandered away from God. Jesus said of the city of Capernaum, because of all the miracles that took place there, and they still didn't believe in him, he said, woe to you, Capernaum. It'll be better for, it'll be better for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah than for you on the day of judgment because of all the miracles that you saw. So please, for your own safety, my skeptical friend, do not demand another miracle from God because you're counting on it not happening anyway, and even if you get it, you're gonna demand more, and you're gonna demand more, and you're gonna demand more. You are literally breathing in all the proof you need. You, in fact, yourself are proof of God. And you know in your heart, you know in your heart of hearts that your current worldview doesn't account for the origins of matter, hey, dirt, much less life, much less morality. There is a meaning and there's a purpose of life. That's why you haven't committed suicide yet. You know this. You know it to be true. So don't demand another miracle of God. Look at the text. You know, you know, that even if you get the proof that you seek, it won't be enough for you. And if you get proof upon proof upon proof upon proof, all this will do is stack up the docket that is levied against you in judgment before God. Because all these miracles upon miracles upon proof upon proof, they all just become opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity for you to have repented, but you didn't. So don't further condemn yourself. Don't further condemn yourself. Instead, today, step forward in faith already. Believe that Jesus is Lord. Don't demand that he do as you say before you believe in him. Think on the faultiness of that premise. The obedience were a pretext for existence. My kids would cease to exist if that were the case. <laughs> Something doesn't have to obey you in order to exist. You know that too. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. I want you, my skeptical friend, to listen to what's drawing upon your heart as we read this text because that's the Holy Spirit of God bringing you from death to life. That's what's happening. And today's the day of salvation for you. No more excuses. No more looking at the Bible at surface level. No more thinking of it in merely earthly terms. Let us not underestimate what the word of God is. Jesus meant everything that he said. All right, look, look back to this text. Let's, let's, get some, let's get a running start. Okay, at the feeding of the 5,000, we were in largely Jewish territory, and we had how many baskets left over? 12. How many disciples were there? How many tribes of Israel were there? All right, so you can see this is largely aimed at the Jewish people. In the book of Romans, three different times, it says salvation is first for the Jew and then for the Greek. First for the Jew, then for the Greek. First for the Jew, then for the Greek. This is a chronology. I believe it's literal. And we see that played out. We see that, we see that personified in the book of Acts when the gospel comes to the large crowd of Jews gathered in chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost where there are Jews from every nation. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They're able to speak and hear in languages that they don't know. And as a result, the gospel now has overcome the language barrier, undoing the work of the Tower of Babel. And now there is a gospel message en route to every Jewish nation in the world. Then the same thing happens in Acts chapter 10. So salvation is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Salvation was depicted in the feeding of the 5,000. We talked about this how the, the disciples went to Jesus, they got the bread and they brought it to the people and they, they went to Jesus and then they brought it to the people. They got the bread of life from Jesus and they brought it to the people and they found that it was just inexhaustible. They would go to Jesus, get the bread of life and bring it to the people and by the time they had distributed it to everybody in groups of 50 at a time, there was an abundance left over for the distributors themselves. 
This was a picture of what was about to happen after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Those same disciples would then take the bread of life, take Jesus and spread it to the people, and take Jesus and spread the news to the people, and take Jesus and spread the news to the people, and now we name what year it is based on those events. Revival broke out and history was broken in half because of it. The feeding of the 5,000 was more than a meal. It was a teaching. Now, the feeding of the 4,000 comes in chapter eight. But here, there are seven baskets left over. And the Greek word used to describe the basket is a different kind of basket. It's the same word that's used in the book of Acts to describe this giant basket that could fit a man inside it. And there are not 12 left over. There are seven left over. Why is that? Why are there 12 left over when ministering to the Jews, seven left over when ministering to the Greeks? Here's what I propose. Salvation is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. There were seven Gentile nations in the land of Canaan when Israel arrived. Did you know that? They're named in Deuteronomy chapter seven, verses one and, verses one and two. Look at this. Deuteronomy seven, one and two. See? See? When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering, take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. This is the seven nations that inhabited the land of Canaan ahead of time. This is also used in the recollection of these events in Acts chapter 13, verse 19. The same seven Gentile nations in the land of Canaan are listed as Paul and Barnabas just recount the story of what God did. Acts 13, 19, after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan. This is also the reason for the seven original people appointed to the office of the diaconate in Acts 6, verse 3. This was birthed in such a way that the Hellenistic widows would be treated equally to the Hebraic widows. The birth of the diaconate was to see to it that the church was treated fairly, that the widows were treated fairly at the distribution of food and that nobody was discriminated against along ethnic lines. Isn't that beautiful that the birth of the diaconate was to preserve the unity of the church along ethnic lines? And how many of them were there? Seven. Seven men of good repute. This, their, their job was to see to it that the, the widows were all treated fairly, that these Jewish men likely would have to see to it that these Greek women, Hellenistic widows, would be treated the same. So when I see the seven baskets left over at the feeding of a largely Gentile crowd in Mark chapter eight, I believe it is another depiction of how salvation is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. The number seven also speaks to completeness thematically throughout scripture. It is the number of days that God took to create everything that is and then rested. So the number seven is deliberate. It serves a purpose. All right, that's also what's at play in the text immediately before in Mark 7, when this woman, who is a, a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, is begging Jesus to perform a miracle for her, and then Jesus pushes back. She is begging him for miraculous bread, the crumbs of the table. She equates herself to the ceremonially least clean animal in all of Hebrew culture. She calls herself a dog. I have heard militant anti-Christian feminists use this passage to critique Christianity. Totally missing the point. This is about God loving the Gentiles as much as he loves the Jews. The, the salvation is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. This is a Gentile Syrophoenician woman equating herself to the ceremonially least clean animal in all, of, in all of Jewish belief and asking Jesus for grace and Jesus gives it. This was immediately before the feeding of the 4,000. So we see this grace upon the Jews. We see this grace now upon the Gentiles. This Syrophoenician Gentile woman was the first among many who would usher in this outpouring of grace upon now the Gentiles. So this brings us to verse 11 of chapter eight. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now, they had forgotten to bring bread, which is funny because they just had seven giant 
baskets left over. Now they had forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Do you think they're missing the point completely? <laughs> Thinking in earthly terms, not hearing the heavenly reality of what Jesus is saying? They look silly right now, but do we do the exact same thing? Underestimating this text. Oh, those are earthly words. No, they're heavenly truths. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that we have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you see why I'm emphasizing this? It's because Jesus did. Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Okay, Jesus drove this point home to his disciples. That's why I drive it home to us, that we might understand. So let me press Jesus' questions to his disciples, to you right now. Do you still not yet understand the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000? Jesus asked his disciples, let, let us press the same question to our hearts. Have you totally underestimated the Bible? And if you were to grasp it, would it change the way that you live? Look at verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, do you see anything? Shocking miracle. And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. We're going to come back and discuss this. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? The most important question you'll ever answer in your life. Who do you say Jesus is? At the conclusion of our sermons, you get the chance to say Jesus is Lord. That's who I say that Jesus is. By the Holy Spirit, that's who I say. My prayer is that you, my skeptical friend, would say the same. Do not underestimate these words. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. When we come back, we'll look at the Matthew 16 account of the same conversation. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's an ancient prophetic title going all the way back to the book of Daniel, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Good luck, Peter. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. It was a harsh moment for Peter, but it's a fair question to us. Where's your mind? And the things of man or the things of God? And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You see why I came back to chapter eight, right? This is heavy stuff. Let's unpack this. So we've seen the miraculous feeding of the 4,000 in the opening verses. Then the Pharisees demand a sign in verses 11 through 13. Other translations, other, other uh, gospel accounts of the same, the same exchange describe Jesus saying no sign is going to be given to this generation except for the sign of Jonah. 
In the same way that Jonah disappeared in, disappeared in the belly of the fish and three days later, later came up again, the Son of Man, that's Jesus, will disappear into the heart of the earth and, and then three days later rise again. He refused to perform miracles on demand. He even gave a warning, beware the generation that demands signs and wonders. If your whole faith is dependent upon signs and wonders, it's not really faith. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. Hebrews 11, step forward in faith today. My skeptical friends, stop demanding miracles. Step forward in faith and believe that you may see. Now, let's talk about the, the, the following passage, verse 14 through, verses 14 through 16. It's fascinating because he mentions leaven or yeast. And he says, the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod all right, what, is, what does he mean by that? I believe that the leaven of the Pharisees refers to their hypocrisy and their false teaching, their legalism. And then the leaven of Herod, I believe, just refers to his debauchery, his utter debauchery. You guys are gonna think I'm a huge nerd. Some of you already do, so that's fine. When I was in middle school, I did a science fair project that like, lasted through middle school and, and it, like, it, like took home, it like took home some metal from the, the state science fair, all right? Like I got free tickets to Disney World because of the science fair project. It was, it was awesome. I took just a little bit of my grandmother's leaven, just a little bit of that yeast, and that was the control. And then I had six variables, and I just fed those batches of yeast various recipes and then just observed the kind of bread that they made and they evaluated the bread along a certain rubric, and this went to the state science fair. And I learned something, just like a teaspoon, all it took was a teaspoon of the yeast cultures from my grandmother's sourdough yeast starter to make six loaves of bread, and that, those cultures are all still alive today. <laughs> just a little bit, just a tiny teaspoon was enough to make infinite loaves of bread. So. Uh, why leaven? Why yeast? Why that particular imagery? Just a little bit of it is able to expand the entire loaf of bread and allow bubbles to form and the, and the, the dough to rise across an entire loaf of bread. Just a little bit of the, the leaven of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy, their legalism. Just a little bit of hypocrisy in your life is enough to rob you of your integrity. Just a little bit of legalism in your life is enough to ruin your view of the gospel and, and, and ruin the way you interpret the outside world. Just a little bit of the leaven of Herod, just a little bit of debauchery in your life is enough to rob you of your holiness. Just a little bit of leaven is all it takes to cause the whole thing to rise. If you are a holy man of God, a holy woman of God for six days a week, you're a sinner. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware the leaven of Herod. Even a little bit is all it takes, even a teaspoon. I've seen it. Middle school Jesse saw it firsthand. Got to go to Splash Mountain because of it. Just a little bit of leaven is all it takes. It can spread throughout your entire life. The hypocrisy of the Pharisees, the legalism of the Pharisees, the debauchery of Herod. That's my interpretation of what he meant by the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, but it's totally lost on the disciples. They immediately say, we don't have any bread. Like they, they immediately go to the earthly terms, don't they? Miss the heavenly reality and just focus on the earthly terms of what Jesus is saying. Right, they, they completely, completely miss the point. Verse, verse 16 says, and they began discussing with, another, with one another the fact that they had no bread. Right over their heads. All right, they're, they're thinking merely in physical terms. They were looking to the physical object of Jesus' lesson, talking about bread and missing the larger heavenly picture about hypocrisy, about legalism, about debauchery. They were thinking about literal physical bread. Have you been treating the word of God the same way? Have you been like the disciples? It's just a collection of stories. It's a series of miracles. Jesus merely healed people. No, he's Lord, he's risen, he's here. Now repent because he's Lord. Give your life to him. Repent completely. Do not underestimate this text. It's true, I mean, like our physical realities are mere shadows and reflections 
of a spiritual realm that exists all around us. We can cross these thresholds that exist physically, and crossing those thresholds has spiritual implications to it. For example, it's just a bottle of wine, right? But if you consume too much of it, then you sin. Okay, I'll confess, I've committed that sin before. I've been there, my friend. These are physical realities, but they carry spiritual implications. They're eternal implications to our actions. Do not underestimate Jesus' callings unto holiness. When you see a wedding, there's more going on than your friend or your family member dressed in the most beautiful white dress you've ever seen, walking up the aisle, and a groom who is just beside himself, lifting the veil and saying, you look perfect. This is a reenactment of what Revelation foretells that we are the bride of Christ, that we as the church, the bride of Christ, that we'd be presented before Jesus, the bridegroom, without spot or wrinkle or any kind of blemish and made perfect by the grace of God. Ephesians 5 says this, that husbands and wives would be a reenactment of the gospel above Christ and the church. There's more than meets the eye on the wedding day. Likewise, you, there's more to you. There is more to you You are more than a collection of cells. You are more than what is physical. You are more than merely what you do. You are more than a PhD in astrophysics. There are multiples of those in this church. You are more than a software engineer. You are more than a homemaker. There is eternal significance to what you do when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The whole sum of everything in this world, when added up, everything that is beneath the sun, meaningless, meaningless. All of it is meaningless. Just ask Solomon as he wrote Ecclesiastes. The things of this earth that we amass for ourselves and the accomplishments and the trophies that we make ourselves don't mean a thing. But whatever you give in your life towards the gospel is eternal in nature. And your labor that you give in the Lord is never in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. There is more to you. There is more at play in this moment than mere bread, and the disciples missed the point. Let us not likewise miss the point. There is more to you. There is more to you than merely the physical, merely the outward appearance. That's why Jesus pressed the question further, do you not yet understand? Do you not yet understand? It was right for him to harp on this. Let's talk about the healing that came next. Verse 22 through through 26, this healing of the blind man. It almost looks like a misfire at first, doesn't it? Did you see that? Okay, first of all, he spat on the man's face. What? <laughs> Let's talk about that. And, then, and second of all, it's like Jesus failed at first. Did you see that? Uh, and like he couldn't really see. He could just sort of see. Everybody looked like trees walking around. Like did Jesus mess up? Oh, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> no, for real this time, come here. And then he's able to see completely. First of all, imagine that from the perspective of a spectator. Like Jesus had a reputation and crowds were following him at this point. And you've come and you've watched this. Oh man, here's Jesus. Here's a blind dude. Give me some popcorn. It's about to go down. What's he gonna do? How's he gonna heal him? Is he gonna make a hurricane in his hand and like blow it on the man's face? Is he gonna manifest a a Gibson Les Paul and then play Billy Joel songs till the man can see Centuries before Billy Joel's birth. <laughs> How is he going? To, like, we could do this all day. <laughs> Are the number of ways that Jesus could have done it, but how did Jesus do it? Here it is Jesus, a blind man. The suspense is killing everybody. And then Jesus hawks a big one right in the man's face. <laughs> that was not, that was not what I was expecting. That was way less majestic than I was imagining it. Let's be objective, that's gross and and kind of mean actually. I think we all feel even worse. Like not only is he a blind man, now he's a blind man with spit on his face. Like he's worse off now than he was before he came face to face with Jesus. Oh wait, Jesus is touching him now, he can see? Wait, he can't really see? This is the worst day ever for this guy. 
Like imagine it from the perspective of the outsider. Do you know that Joaquin Phoenix is doing a movie about Jesus and this is the line he refused to perform. This is the verse that he refused to act out. All right, Jesus doesn't have to act on your terms, okay? Like it's not your job, Joaquin Phoenix, to, to tell Jesus how to behave. Okay, he is Lord. He never healed the same people quite the same way twice. But there is a theme in the way that he would heal the blind that fascinates me. At one point, he would spit in the mud and smear the mud on somebody's face and tell him to go. He, this blind man never actually saw Jesus until later when Jesus was shushing him. He, he, was, he went to the pool at Siloam, which means sent, by the way, and washed his face, and then he could see. We are all like this blind man. They're all rendered filthier at the beginning of the miracle, and then as they become clean, they're able to see. I think that I think that there's something eternal here. I think we ought not merely look at this in the, the face surface value, not just in earthly terms, but the, here is the blind sinner rendered filthy, and as he comes clean, he's able to see. Do you see a picture of the gospel in the way that Jesus healed the blind? Do you think that maybe there are eternal consequences to these earthly terms? I see a picture of the gospel, and I see my reflection in that man upon the first touch from Jesus. He could sort of see what is, but not really. Everything was vague. It wasn't the real thing. That's like us now. That's the first miracle. A blind man could see. That's the healing. The second touch, I believe, is a picture of glorification in heaven. Because right now we can barely see the truth. Through the physical realm, there is spiritual significance, but we can't really see it. We can't see the spiritual realm. We, we underestimate the spiritual significance of earthly physical realities, but one day we will see him face to face and see everything as it is. Here's 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see dimly in a mirror, but then one day in heaven, face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. I see this initial partial healing of this man as emblematic of us where we currently are in a picture of the coming glorification where one day we will see fully. There are heavenly realities to these earthly truths. Do not underestimate the text of God's word. From here, from here, Jesus makes this statement over Peter in verses 27 through 30, and the Matthew 16 account shows us something tremendous about it. Okay, Peter answers correctly, Jesus is the Christ. In the Matthew 16 account of the same text, here's what Jesus says. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a profound, soaring promise. That Peter would be the one upon whom the New Testament church would be launched that the church would transition from the Old Testament era into the New Testament era, beginning with, I believe, Peter's ministry in Pentecost in Acts chapter two. But then what immediately follows? Like this is Peter's big moment, right? You are the rock upon whom I will build my church. And then just like three verses later, what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. It's been a very dynamic experience for Peter. His most soaring moment is followed quickly by his, one of his most hurtful downfalls. Get behind me, Satan. Oh, like there's no, there's no more crushing thing that Jesus could have called Peter. Why is Jesus being so harsh here? It's because Peter was thinking in earthly terms. And all of this on top of the fact that Jesus had just spelled out exactly what was gonna happen. Not in metaphor, not in parable, not through an object lesson, not even through a miracle, just plain language. Look, look at the previous verse, look at verse 31. It began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Do you see that in verse 32? Okay, this takes no rubric by which to interpret it. Just ears. It's plain, clear truth. And the disciples all say, uh-huh. And then when it actually happens, they all lose their minds and flee and run. Like he said it so plainly. So directly, so clearly, no parable, no imagery, no metaphor, no simile, nothing, no puppets, no felt board, just here's what's going to happen. And then Peter's response is, no, this must never happen. Like, Peter, what, what Jesus just prophesied was the gospel itself. 
He just described how he's going to save us all. And you said, no, this must never happen. That's why Jesus called him Satan because it was Satan's will that Jesus not be crucified. It was Satan's will that he not rise again. So Peter became a mouthpiece for the devil himself. So Jesus rebukes him harshly, but let it, let it not be lost on us that this beloved bonehead Peter would be the one who would get up at Pentecost and address a crowd of thousands to proclaim the gospel. And the church that we are in today can trace its ancestry back to that moment. God did this through Peter. What might he do through you? Do you believe that the promise that Jesus made over Peter applies to Highlands Community Church? Because I do. Whom do we worship here? Jesus Christ. As a result, we are his church. What was the wording of his promise over Peter in Matthew 16? The gates of hell will not overcome my church. Highlands Community Church, listen to your pastor's heart. Hell can't stop you. So fear nothing. Proclaim the gospel with boldness. Do not underestimate the words of God because they are life to those who need Jesus. Hell can't stop us. Let us fear no one. And then we close with Jesus' own words. Some of you have been living a shallow, surface-level Christianity, thinking of the words of the Bible only in earthly terms, but not anymore. Not, not today. Never again, forevermore. You're gonna take Jesus at his heavenly intent. Stop looking at the surface of the glimmer of the water to the neglect of the treasures within the deep. Today you dive in deep. Today you believe the heavenly truths. No more surface-level Christianity. No more being a stupid, fake hypocrite. Get real. Be holy. Live out the Great Commission. Apply the teachings. I'm gonna do it right now, Gentiles. Here's some bread of life for you. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. All right, he's not a moral teacher. He's Lord. It's not a set of allegories to make your day better. I don't care about your day. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord, so repent from sin forevermore. Be saved from eternity in hell, which is the default for sinners like me, and instead be saved by the grace of God and spend eternity in heaven forevermore. Live your life in light of heaven, which is forever, rather than the earth, which is temporary. This is why Jesus so soundly rebukes and drives home this teaching. If anyone would follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. You wanna save your life? Lose it forever. Stop living for yourself. Stop living for today. Stop living for the now and the temporary because everything you build for yourself in this life will fade away but everything you do for the gospel of Jesus Christ will last forevermore so for whom are you living today's the day that your hypocrisy is crucified forever live for Jesus forevermore do not underestimate the words of God they were inspired by the spirit and they're gripping you by the heart now yes that's that God in whom you profess disbelief he's calling you to life from your sin so rise up Rise up. I want to go before the Lord with two prayers. If you're sick and tired of your surface level fake hypocrisy, today's the day that you repent from that and step into the deep things of God. Deny yourself, take up your cross, your instrument of death, and follow Jesus. Lose your life that you may save it. And if you are like the blind man, filthy in sin, that you may see, I pray that you will be touched by Jesus and know the truth that you would lose your life on this earth to gain your life in heaven forevermore. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our direct application of the intent of the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 right here in this room. Here's the point that the disciples missed. You, hearing the gospel, being saved today. Let's go before the Lord now. God, I believe in you. I believe that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only son that if I would believe in him, I would not die, but have everlasting life. I confess that I'm a sinner and I've fallen short of the glory of God. And I believe that the consequences for that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the way. I believe that Jesus is the truth. I believe that Jesus is the life. And I know there's no way I can come to you, Father, except through Jesus. So right here and now, 
filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I take the bread of life. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Highlands Community Church say, Jesus is Lord. Say it, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now God, let me be saved. God, let me be saved. God, I pray on behalf of the penitent Christian who is caught in hypocrisy, the very leaven of the Pharisees they've been feasting on. No more, never again. God, I'm sorry for my fake Christianity. I'm sorry for my stupid hypocrisy. I'm sorry for looking at your heavenly truth and acting like they're merely earthly terms. God, I follow your call into the deep. Would you wipe the filth from my eyes that I could see? God, I believe now, I believe now that you fed those thousands the bread of life, that I would take the bread of life and give it to others and make disciples of Jesus Christ. I hereby take up my cross. I deny myself. I don't want to live for me anymore. That hasn't been working for me. I want to live for you, God. Everything I do for myself will pass away, but every word you've spoken will last forever. God, I am yours. You are Lord. You're the boss. Your will, not mine anymore. Nail my hypocrisy to the cross forevermore. I love you, Jesus. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you rise up and worship together, some of us for the very first time as Christians today.